You ask, we answer. Welcome to Can This Marriage Be Saved, where we go up against common relationship problems and help you determine if this relationship should stay or go. Okay, tonight we're here with Rifka and Shlomo Slacken, and we are talking about communication problems. Shlomo, I know that one of the top problems that our readers struggle with are communication problems and communication issues. Why do you think that is the number one issue that couples are reporting in that they're experiencing as their number one problem? I would think there's so many things that are so much worse. Of course, if a couple is struggling or suffering from infidelity, that's you know number one usually, but there's so many couples that are reporting in that communication problems are their number one frustration in their marriage. Why do you think that's so? All of those issues that couples have need to be discussed. So even if the issue is infidelity, if they can't communicate, they can't work on the issue because there's nothing to talk about. We can't not communicate. So whether it's through words or through body language, the way of interaction is to communicate. And speech is what makes us uniquely human. So that's something that we're going to have to be able to deal with in a relationship. And most of us don't really know how to talk about difficult issues. We don't know how to ask for our needs. We don't know how to say it in a way that makes each other feel safe. And we often get triggered and get reactive. So just having a simple conversation about something could lead to a big explosion in a relationship, which leads to negative energy and discord. And it's sometimes quite challenging to even get back to the table and get back to the positivity. So communication is really the foundation of any successful relationship. So you're saying maybe it's number one because about every single issue that a couple has to deal with, they have to first deal with communication. So if you're having trouble with money or you're having trouble in the bedroom, you need communication to be able to talk about those things. And if you don't have the ability to communicate about those things, then you can't really do it at all. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Because if you can't tell your partner what you need from them, if they can't hear what you need from them, then how can you get your needs met and how can they meet your needs? Mm -hmm. So it's important to learn a way where you can really express what you're feeling And because your partner can't read your mind and to learn in a way in which you can listen, but you can really hear what your spouse is saying and not just get defensive or interpret or kind of have it go in one ear and out the other. Okay. That makes sense. Now, what are some quick tips for how people can improve their communication? Well, the first thing to do is to be intentional, to think about when they're communicating, what their intention is, what the purpose of the communication is. Deep down inside, we all want to connect. Uh, I don't think any of us really want to hurt our spouse, but sometimes it sure seems like it to our spouse when we hear our spouse talk to us in a way that's not so nice. So first of all, having the intention that what I'm about to share is for the purpose of connection and for the purpose of the greater good of the relationship. So to have that in mind. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure your spouse is available to hear you. So before you get into that part, when you're saying the intention, so How do you do that, though, if you're really angry with your spouse? You know, you're saying you should have the intention that this conversation is going to be to connect. But what if you're really irritated with your spouse? How can you have in mind that, you know, I'm about to have a conversation with my spouse, but I'm really angry? I would think it would be very hard to to keep in mind that you really want to connect. Well, it would be hard. And it could be that if you are angry, that it's probably not the best time to speak to your spouse. But even if you can't, hold back or you feel like you need to speak to your spouse at this time, you need to think about, well, think selfishly for a minute. What is your intended result? Do you want your spouse to change and to do what you want? And then this is you know, like a worst case scenario. Let's say you're not at the level of thinking about connection, but you want your spouse to change and do what you want. So logically, how do you get that? If you put your spouse on the defensive, if you pick on them, if you criticize them, if you yell at them, they're probably not going to do what you want. They're probably not going to change and they're probably just going to get reactive and blame you. So if you want them to change, if you're frustrated about something and you want things to be different, then you want to make sure it's said in a way that they'll actually be able to hear and receive it so that they actually will be open to changing. Is that just kind of like some kind of trick, like, you know, a manipulating type of thing where you get your spouse to do what you want? No, it's not manipulating. I mean, I'm just saying from a selfish perspective, you know, you can have that in mind, but Ultimately, you want things to be different and you're hurting. Mm -hmm. So So it's to your benefit. It's something that it's to the relationship's benefit. If you're miserable in the relationship and something needs to change and you want something to be different, then you need to be able to articulate it in a way that your spouse will hear it so that change can happen. Mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, you know, if you just want escalation and you want things to get worse and you want continued conflict, then go ahead and, and yell at them and just kind of dump on them. But if you really want positive change and you want things to be different, then you have to say it in a way that they can receive it, even if you're angry with them. Mm, very interesting. I'm thinking of what some of the questions are that readers have sent us, you know, over the time that we've asked for questions to come in. I know that communication issues were definitely number one. I guess, you know, I'd like to know more about why communicating is so hard. You know, if it's seemingly so easy to do, you know, have a bit of decency and respect and speak in a nonviolent way, non-reactive, why is it so hard? Communication is hard because I think most of us lack emotional maturity, or that's what we're kind of going towards, we're growing towards, we're aiming towards, we're hoping to achieve that. But in many ways, both partners are really like two children that don't know how to ask for what we want. We don't know how to say things in a mature way. And, you know, we just see constantly in interpersonal relationships, even not in marriages, people get offended easily. They don't say what they want. They don't say what they mean. People's feelings are hurt. Relationships are damaged. And if people would be more emotionally mature than and upfront with people and honest and safe with people, then it would be much easier for people to get along and to really know what people are thinking and to avoid any of these miscommunications and assumptions that occur in, in I would say, majority of our relationships. So it is a skill that is to be learned and to become emotionally mature, to understand what we're feeling, to be conscious of what's triggering us, to ask for what we need, to find that beneath the frustration instead of focusing on what the other person is doing wrong, to take ownership instead of blaming, to differentiate. I think that's one of the most difficult things that we see couples have a hard time with. And when we teach couples dialogue process, it's really helping them become dialogical and differentiating and realize that they're not their spouse. They don't need to feel the same way about things. They can have different opinions and it can be okay. And it in no way invalidates the other person's point of view. It's a very hard concept to understand. But if we're looking from a childish perspective and kind of a black or white, it's either my way or the highway. You know, I'm right and you're wrong. But a mature perspective is able to see that, you know, we both can have valid opinions and we don't have to agree with each other. And that's perfectly OK. But that's something that even children, it takes them time to be able to get to that level of maturity, to be able to not think black or white. And in relationships, it takes work to get to that maturity, to be able to see that both of you can have a valid point of view. Hmm. Now, I know in your Marriage Mastery Program, you really delve in depth with how to communicate, how to have an imago relationship dialogue, and to really make the time to speak together with your spouse to have a dialogue. And I don't want to get into that right this minute, but I'm thinking of a particular example that maybe if you can help me with for how to kind of communicate on the fly with someone who doesn't really know that I'm about to, you know, enter into a dialogue with them. There's a particular family member of ours that I feel that every time she comes over and sees our little son, she expects him to right away maybe give her a hug or say hello. And sometimes he's in the middle of playing and she takes great offense to that if he doesn't say hello to her. And I know that, you know, he's a four-year-old and he's playing. And I know that there's different developmental stages for little boys and they don't necessarily feel comfortable, you know, dropping what they're doing to say hello to an adult. And it's becoming a little bit of a frustration for me that every time she comes over, I can see her getting irritated with him and kind of forcing him to say hello to her. How can I, you know, have a quick conversation? Does it need to be so serious? Do I need to make a time and ask her to sit down? Or can I say, you know, something kind of like just, you know, casual, like, you know, I see that you want our son to, you know, pay attention to you when you come in. But, you know, if he's in the middle of playing, it's going to be hard for him. What can I do to kind of make that go easier? Well, the first thing I think that would be helpful for you is just before even having a conversation with her is to realize that it might seem like a kind of almost irrational response that she's having. And to understand that there's probably something that a trigger that she's having and have compassion for her that she's coming from a, a wounded place that for some reason, this fact that our son is not saying something, it's triggering her, really bothering her almost in an irrational way. So there's something deeper there. So just knowing that and knowing that she's not being malicious might help you, you know, deal with it better and overlook it, but unless be less confrontational or reactive about it. But also once you do speak with her, you know, you don't have to have a formal dialogue, but even just to say, you know, I wanted to talk to you about something 
you know, when are you available to talk about it? And then say, as you said, you know, when you expect our son to say hello, you know, it sometimes upsets me because I feel like, well, that you're getting upset with him and you have judgments about him. And I really don't think he's doing anything malicious not to say hi to you, but you know, he might be in the middle of something, might be in the middle of playing or explaining that, explaining that, you know, it's an age thing. We had other kids that did the same thing and they've grown out of it and he will too. And in no way is he trying to offend you or be rude or show that he doesn't care about you. And that's helpful because I think that's what's actually allowed me to go this far with her is because I do know that there's a story there and I do have compassion for her story. So I think that's what's held me back for so long, but it's starting to get to me a little bit more. I know I've heard you talk before, not in session, but just in your material about getting curious And maybe I can also add in my conversation with her and say, I'm a little curious about, you know, what it is that bothers you so much or why you feel so offended by it. I mean, I hope I can have the patience to kind of hear that because I am a little bit upset by this situation. But the idea of curiosity makes me curious. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, a lot of times we have all these ideas about what's going through the other person's head. And we want to kind of put those aside and really get curious and allow them to share and allow them to open up and, you know, to kind of put yourself aside, empty yourself out and really, you know, know that there's something there that makes sense and know that there's a deeper story and just really want to listen and sincerely want to hear where they're coming from and what upsets them so. And that attitude of curiosity will make the other person feel safe enough to open up and feel that you really care about what they have to say. And what can I do if while I'm genuinely trying to get curious, she's starting to explain herself and I find myself getting a little bit, you know, of a rise going on or I'm getting a little bit upset. Instead, I know what I, you know, would want to do, which would be to respond. But I know that you don't have people do that in Imago. Right. I mean, you could mirror back and repeat back what she said. But if you're not doing it in a formal context, then you could just kind of internally mirror yourself, meaning imagine yourself mirroring back as opposed to just you know, saying anything out loud to her, but also just having in mind that she has a story and that you're just going to keep listening until it makes sense to uh-huh. you. And what do you mean by internally mirroring? I haven't heard that before. Instead of repeating back what I heard you say is this, you can kind of almost inside of yourself, instead of that internal uh, reactivity where you kind of want to just respond and say something, just imagine yourself talking with in your head almost, you know, what I heard you say was X, Y, and Z. Hmm. Meaning knowing that what she's saying is her perspective and it's not something that you need to take personally and you're really still, it's just kind of an internal reminder that you're still in her world. I like that. So you really can just kind of say it inside of yourself and that works? It can be helpful to self-regulate so that you don't get reactive. Hmm. That's very interesting. And for whoever's listening, if you're more curious about the Imago Dialogue, we recommend that you read our blog or get your hands on Marriage Mastery, which is our audio visual program, which goes very much into detail about how to communicate properly and effectively. And we model in our DVD program how we actually have a formal Imago Dialogue and how you can have one at home for optimal communication. Let's see what other readers have written about communication being a problem. For them, I mean, there's always, you know, verbal abuse is an issue, name calling, you know, kind of the more aggressive ways of communicating. Those are, you know, a problem for many people. I don't know what you would say about that because that's kind of a a whole nother topic. But what would you say if somebody feels like their communication is abusive? Are you talking about the person who's talking in the quote unquote abusive way or the person who's on the receiving end? I mean, I guess I was thinking of the person on the receiving end, but really anything that would help, I guess, you know, either spouse can become verbally abusive at any point in time. And there's probably different forms of verbal abuse, like criticism and, you know, passive aggressiveness. And there's just so much in communication that can go wrong, it seems. Well, again, if there's something that's bothering you and you want to criticize your spouse, think about what you want as opposed to what is not being done correctly. Mm hmm. So meaning if there's something that obviously if if you're feeling critical, there's something and you're upset about your spouse, something they did. So instead of focusing on what they did wrong, think about what you need from them. Mm -hmm. So what I need from you, instead of you don't clean the house, you just leave it a a mess and I can't stand coming home from work and seeing this. It would really mean a lot to me if the house were clean. It would help me have peace of mind and share about why it's important to you. 
And you see how that's so much different. Mm -hmm. If you're coming from a place of negativity and criticism, so your spouse's response is just going to be to go the other way. They're not going to hear it. It's almost going to put up a wall. It's like whatever you're saying, it's not even penetrating. Mm -hmm. But if you can say it in a non-threatening way, then your spouse is more likely to be receptive. Of course, anything that's uh, you know yelling, screaming, outbursts of anger, you know they're very unhelpful in our relationship. And we talk about these in the program and detox your marriage about the importance of removing such language from your relationship. But for those of you who feel that you have those feelings brewing inside, again, understanding what's going on, why am I feeling angry, and what am I not getting, and mm -hmm. basically. You know, just like a child acts out when they're not getting their needs met. So if we don't know how to use our words, we're going to act out in ways that are not beneficial for the relationship. So think about learning how to express what you need and what you feel in a more mature way by getting in touch with what's bothering you and explaining to your spouse what you need from them as opposed to what's wrong. I think some people's fear, though, is that if they don't yell and scream, they're not going to get what they want. Right. Well, that's what they learned growing up because we learn growing up you know, we have certain adaptations that protect us growing up. So some of us didn't get our needs met unless we made a big fuss. So we're afraid that in our relationship, that's the only way that we can get a spouse to meet our needs. But that protected us growing up. But that's going to do the opposite of what we want in a mature relationship. Why is that? It's because usually our spouse is going to have the opposite reaction. If we're the more aggressive one who needs to make a big fuss, our spouses, when they don't get their needs met, they're more likely to be the one to retreat, the minimizer. So the more that we get aggressive, the more they're going to retreat. So we're basically exacerbating the situation. So we're exacerbating the situation by speaking up in a way that is aggressive. Mm. So we need to get ourselves safe and to realize that this is not our childhood and that this is our spouse. And we can be open to a new possibility that we could really get our needs met if we could ask in a different way. Do you think it really works? I've seen it work time and time again. So I know that it works. I mean, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine on the phone and she says, you know, she comes home, her husband's taking care of the kids and she comes home and there's dishes in the sink and the house is a mess. And she says, you know, I just tell him, I nag him, you know, you couldn't do the dishes. I come home from a long day of work. And I kind of was trying to explain to her, you know, maybe think about how you're asking him that he really can't even you know, hear that you want the dishes done because he thinks you're nagging him. So he just kind of shuts down. Do you think that's kind of what happens? Of course. When people are nagged, then they put up their defenses and you know they don't want to do it. And they're not able to see it for what it is. They're not able to see, wow, you know, it was really hard for you. You come home from a long day of work and you're tired and hungry. And the last thing you want to do is see the dishes, especially if I you haven't been doing anything all day. You know, they can't see it from a rational perspective. They go straight to that reactive part of their brain mm -hmm. so the nagging is just almost it's like a switch to say like turn off my ears like i'm not going to hear what you have to say mm -hmm. and i'm just going to put up my defenses and i'm going to put up a wall and i'm not going to give in and i'm not going to do anything for you because you're just pushing me and pushing me and pushing me so nagging really is unhelpful in a relationship mm -hmm. so again we want to come from a perspective of you know sharing what you do appreciate you know i do appreciate that you watch the kids and i realize that you probably were busy and you know it would really mean a lot to me if you could do the dishes or let's talk about how we can figure out a way where we can make that happen because it would really be important to me. And the more that you can share about why it's important and the more your spouse can hear, the more your spouse will be like, of course, I'd love to be able to do that for you. So maybe they're not able to for whatever reason, but in general, they're going to be much more willing to do what you need if you can ask them in a kind way where they're not feeling threatened. I imagine this can be used with parenting as well. Sure, of course. It's like if you nag kids, nobody wants to be nagged. Or yelled at. Or yelled or at. Or criticized. Of or course. screamed at. Right. It's a, it leads them to shut down. Well, either they're going to shut down and just check out or they're going to just become aggressive and fight back. Hmm. So you're putting them on the defensive and their sole goal at that moment will be to protect themselves and survive however they go about doing that. So they couldn't care less about what you have to say. They are just in survival mode and very threatened and whatever you ask them to do is not going to be received because you're threatening them and making them unsafe. So the goal really is in all communication to create enough safety so that both of you can really show up. Because if you're not safe, you can't show up. If you can't show up, you're definitely not going to hear or listen or understand what your spouse is saying. 
So let's summarize. So for somebody that's on the receiving end of very poor communication and for somebody that is a poor communicator, what do you suggest? On the receiving end, do your best to control your reactivity. Uh, learn some of the tools of mirroring so that you can internally repeat back as opposed to respond. Let your spouse kind of share what they need to do or need to share without responding and getting upset. On the sharing end, think about your goal. The goal is to get your needs met at the very least or at the most to connect with your spouse. Say it in a way that will help you get your needs met. Say it in a kind way. Stop criticizing. Stop blaming. Stop saying what you do, as it, meaning the other person does, and focus on what you need, what I need. And when you did this, I felt. No one can argue with feelings. Hmm. So taking responsibility for what you're feeling and how you're reacting, nobody can argue with that. And cutting out the criticism, of course, and saying it in a kind way and you know, not nagging and not blaming, but really just taking ownership and asking for what you want. Beautiful. Well, that sounds very helpful. And I look forward to applying it with everybody that comes my way and especially with you (laughs) as much as possible. And thank you everybody for listening. And we look forward to staying in connection with you and everything that we write and everything that we record for you. So we'd love to hear your feedback on how this audio has helped you in your communication. So we ask that you email any questions that you have to us. You can just click reply to the email address that you received this audio from, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed listening to today's topic. We'll be back again to focus on another topic that is sure to help you with your marriage. For any questions or concerns, please email us at info at themarriagerestorationproject.com with best wishes for your relationship success.